Hey, Junction, it's uh, great to see you here this Thursday night. I'm so excited to be with you. I'm excited just to see um, how we do in week number two of Virtual Junction. I heard from last week that uh, there was just a lot of great feedback, and so we want to just continue to improve and move forward as we get more and more comfortable with meeting virtually here than also your table groups meeting virtually there. Uh, but before we dive into week number two, I guess that's like week number 10. Week number two of this, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Father, I thank you that, that you are King of kings, that you are Lord of lords, and that you are able to be um, at all places at all times, Lord, that no matter where we're watching from, if we're uh, watching alone uh, in, in a room, Father, we're not alone, that you're with us. And Father, if we're watching alone, but we're also in a virtual a chat room right now, Lord, that we're not alone, that you are with each and every person who is there. Father, I, I don't understand how that's possible, but I know it's true, and so I thank you that you are with each of us. And Father, you're not just with each of us passively, you're looking to engage with our, our lives in incredible ways that we can step into and begin to uh, enjoy more and more the life that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ. And so this evening, as we look into your word, Lord, I want to pray that that, uh, that we would find encouragement, we find hope where we need to find that. If we need to, to bump into some conviction, Lord, we find that as well. But Father, we leave this time in your hands. We absolutely love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, excited again to be with you. Week number two uh, with Junction Online. I was just thinking about um, the king we're talking about in our royalty series tonight. His name is Ahab, and there is so much going on in his life. It's interesting that the scripture gives roughly five chapters there, and really a sixth one if you go outside of Kings, but a pretty large chunk of time to this king. And so how do we cover it all? Well, we can't. Um, and so we're going to just kind of hone in on one thing, but as, as we're thinking about that one thing, I was thinking earlier about uh, these, these situations that I have sometimes about just not knowing which which side do I identify with? Which side will I support? You know, if two teams are competing against each other, you know, who do I cheer for? And most of the time, I don't run into, the, in, into issues. You know, I have my favorite team, and then that, I always cheer for them. But a few years ago, I ran into this, this problem. See, I live in College Station, and here it's, it's home of Texas A&M University, and I really like the Aggies. I really like the culture. I like the environment. I'm like, this is amazing. I work with a bunch of Aggies, and so I'm like, Go Aggies. And so I love that aspect of living in a college town. I can cheer for the Aggies, but I'm not an Aggie. I didn't graduate from Texas A&M. I actually graduated from the University of Northern Iowa in Cedar Falls, Iowa. I know. It's a pretty big name school. I know. So I've got these two allegiances when it comes to, to universities, and they'll never play each other, right? I never have to make that decision until a few years ago in the NCAA tournament. The University of Northern Iowa was going to go ahead and play against Texas A&M and the Aggies. Second round, they met, and now I had my identity crisis. Who do I support? Who do I go for? You know, and so I tuned into the game. I'm sitting there. Erin's next to me. She is an Aggie, so I know exactly who she's going for, and I don't want to cheer against her team. And I'm like, what do I do? But then I realized I've got a diploma someplace that says University of Northern Iowa on it, and so I need to go ahead and identify and cheer for the Panthers. And so I'm like, all right, let's do this. And you know what? For most of the game, it seemed like that was the greatest choice I could have ever made. The Panthers were up. They kept going up, and it got to the place with less than 40 seconds left in the game. If you don't remember the game, watch the highlights. I watched them earlier. It was very, very uh, discouraging, to say the least. But there they are. 40 seconds left in the game, and the Panthers are up by 12 points. All the odd makers, all the bookies have said it's a 100% chance. It's impossible for the Panthers to lose. Like, it's impossible for the other team to go ahead and be able to come back from 12 points behind. And so I'm, I'm excited. I'm there like, I chose the right team to identify with. I've got my phone out. I'm looking at Sweet 16 t-shirts. I'm like, I should click order. I'm going to have bragging rights forever. And then the unthinkable happened. As you know, point after point after point after point after point, and just foolish play after foolish play happened, and I'm sitting there going, no, no, my team that I identified which is lost in really incredible, in an incredible fashion, and so it was devastating. But I tell you that because a lot of times throughout the course of our life, we have a hard time 
I think as followers of Jesus, understanding and, and really siding with Jesus at all times. I think sometimes there's these battles that come out and we say, who am I going to identify with? Do I identify fully with Jesus or do I identify with my family? Do I identify fully with Jesus or the people at work? Do I identify fully with Jesus or the friends that I grew up with that want nothing to do with him? So we have this tension that's there and we're caught in these situations of like, who do I identify with? And uh, tonight as we're looking at uh, King Ahab, all throughout his reign, he's having that same question. He has moments where God continually gives him to, to side with him, to identify with Yahweh, the God of Israel. And uh, th they're abundant throughout his, his lifetime, but he never makes the right choice. It just seems like he continually uh, sides with anybody other than Yahweh. And so he's a bad king. So as we're diving into looking at King Ahab, there's three things I want us to look at tonight. I, I want us just to understand the background a little bit more of, of Ahab's life, uh, who, who he was, what did he do. Um, and then I really want us to look at one of these epic battles that basically God is saying, who are you going to choose to align yourself with? Are you going to go ahead and align yourself with Baal? Or are you going to align yourself with me? And so we're going to look at the very famous story there uh, where Elijah is involved there on Mount Carmel. And then from there, we're going to go like, so what? I mean, it's a great story, but what does that actually mean for me? So let's dive in. Uh, with, before anything else, let's dive in and look at the background of King Ahab. As you know, we've got this big, long chart uh, that you sit there, and it looks overwhelming, but we've talked about it. We've broken it down. It's a list of the kings. You've got a northern kingdom at the top and a southern kingdom at the bottom. We've talked about it before that the northern kingdom, all of the kingdoms are bad, all the kings and queens are bad. Ahab is actually located in the northern kingdom. So we know he's going to be bad. Newsflash. That's just the way it is. And it's really interesting if you're, if you're just kind of like sitting there going like, huh, um, what's so bad about being bad? It's really interesting when you look at the northern kingdom, Ahab is the son of Omri. But Omri is like the third dynasty, the third start again for the northern kingdom to find a good king. There's actually three different, again, like dynasties. One that starts with Jeroboam, another one that starts with Basha, and another one that starts with Omri. And so there's this continual change of leadership and change of family leadership in the northern kingdom. Don't follow God. Don't honor God. Let's, okay, no, 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 you reject. Okay, we're going to remove you. Let's find somebody else who's going to honor. No, you're not willing to honor. Around and around we go. Whereas the southern kingdom, it's very interesting there. It's the same line all the way throughout. Even though they're not all good kings, and, and actually the worst of the worst kings is going to come from the southern kingdom, but uh, it's just a, one of those interesting, weird Bible trivia things. So let's dive in looking at Ahab, this, this king who is not a good king. Remember at his time um, that the kingdom has shrunk during Solomon's time, and the, the reign was really big, the reach was really big, but right now the northern kingdom, they have some influence uh, but it's not the same as what the southern kingdom, who has Jehoshaphat, who was a great king, right? Um, they are, have expanded their area of influence really big. So he's got a strong king to the south, and where he is, it's not weak. It's just not back to the heydays. And so he's sitting there maybe going like, oh, the days that used to be. Kingdom is small. They've moved actually the capital to Samaria, so a lot of times you'll read in Scripture um, and it'll refer to Israel as either the northern kingdom, or sometimes it'll say Israel, or sometimes it'll refer to him as Samaria. So you have to kind of watch out for, for that. But we know Ahab was a, a bad king. Uh, again, that's what I like about kings is that uh, the scripture tells us, is this a good guy or a bad guy? We read in 1 Kings 16.30, it says this. It says, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. That's in 1 Kings 16.30. And so uh, highlights of Ahab's life, of this bad life that he had, uh, we just really want to understand, like, he just continued to align himself uh, not and identify himself not with Yahweh uh, for, for basically the most part. We see him that he built an altar to Baal, didn't just stop at the altar, built an entire temple there. We saw that he also began to bring in Asherah and worship uh, Asherah as well. We see that he allowed Jericho, the city of Jericho, to be rebuilt during his time, which uh, you're like, well, what's the big deal with that? If you were to go back in the book of Joshua, once Israel 
uh, defeated, once God actually defeated Jericho, God was very clear that nobody rebuilds the city because if you do, it's going to cost your oldest son's life to lay the foundations. And if you rebuild the gates, as well, it's going to cost you your younger son. And so uh, Ahab just didn't care too much about that. He was, al- he was allowing Jericho to be rebuilt, even though it was costing the builder his sons. Um, the next thing, he married a, a gal named Jezebel. If you think that who you marry doesn't matter, well, if you track Ahab's life, what you see is every time that Jezebel is around, it goes really, really bad. And when she's not there, it doesn't always go good, but it, he's kind of more neutral. And so uh, I always just wonder what would have happened had Ahab actually married better because it just seemed like he really wasn't much of a leader in that marriage. It seemed like Jezebel took things over. And, and what I mean by that is uh, Jezebel was a follower uh, of Baal and was like, that's just who we worship. That's from the country I come from. I'm, I'm, I'm different from you. That's who we worship. I'm not going to change for anything. And so when she came in and married Ahab, she just cleared house as much as she possibly could, killing the prophets of the Lord. And Ahab was like, okay, sounds good. You see another time in Ahab's life, he, he comes home, and as he's coming into what, his palace, he sees his next-door neighbor and thinks, man, that'd be a nice garden. I really wish I could have that garden. And so he talks to the guy. He goes and talks to Naboth and says, hey, can, can I buy your land, or can I give you a different land so I can have this as a garden? And he says, well, king, no, no, this is my family inheritance, and so no. And so Ahab goes into his palace. He's all sulky. Oh, poor me. And Jezebel's like, what's wrong? Well, I can't get the little property next to me. And so she takes care of it. She goes and has him killed, not Ahab, but Naboth killed, and then comes and tells Ahab, hey, good news, that land you wanted, the guy just died. And he's like, oh, good, yay, runs out there. So Ahab, those are just some of his highlights, is not uh, a poster child or following Yahweh or following God in a great way. And as I think about that, you could be really discouraged. You know, probably some of us know people, men and women, who their lives, as, as we've seen them, they just keep pushing back and pushing back and pushing back and not wanting anything to do with God. And it breaks our hearts. And this is one of the cool things. I don't want us to miss this. In the story of, of Ahab, you see that, that God is on the move. All the way throughout, you see God's activity declaring to Ahab that I am. I am the God that you need to follow. I am the God that you need to identify with. And you see it in a lot of different ways. Again, you saw it with the building of Jericho. Even though it costs sons lives, That was fulfilled prophecy. God is saying, what I said will come true. You can trust me, even though it was a negative example. You see another time that um, that God withholds rain, that he uses Elisha and and says, no no more rain. Incredible miracle that unfolds there because it didn't. And so God is saying, look what I am able to do. I'm able to stop weather. Um, Later on, he says, I'll bring rain. Elijah prays for rain, and rain happens. Again, God is declaring I have authority over the weather. You should identify with me. Uh, There are a couple victories that that Israel is outnumbered, and God shows up either through a man of God or a prophet shows up and says, it's going to be okay, God's got this. And so even as Ahab got to experience divine victories, he still was unwilling to identify with God. Truly incredible. Uh, He had another prophet that bumped into him, Micaiah, who had repeated conversations with him telling them the, th- the ways of God, and yet uh, every time Ahab was like, no, 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 no. And then there's, of course, the crowning moment, the Mount Carmel victory for God. He just really shows up, a spoiler alert, in, in incredible ways. And so the point, though, being is Ahab, who was so very um, hard against God and just was unwilling to identify with God, God didn't stop pursuing him. And if we have men and women of our lives who feel that they're very hard towards the gospel, be encouraged. Our God does not stop the pursuit. I think that's just a really beautiful, beautiful truth that we see here in this story. Well, let's, let's just move on here. Um, we're going to see here that uh, there's going to be a big battle here at Mount Carmel. When I think about this big battle, I think of it this way. When in high school I played tennis, and, and this was actually true in college as well, but you had your, your uh, team was made of singles players from numbers one through six. And the coach would put you where he thought you belonged. And then if you were like, I don't really feel like I'm the number three player in this team. I'm really the number two player. You could challenge the player above you, and you would have a match. And if you won the match, then that proved that you were the number two player. And then if you thought I'm the number one player, you could challenge. If you won the challenge match, you went on. So not rocket science. 
We had an exchange student, though, who lived with us and played tennis, and, and uh, it was interesting. He would tell us time in and time out that I am the best player on the team. Yes, I am the best player on the team. Nobody is better than me. And we would ask, like, well, what number do you play? I play number three. Well, you're not the best player. Challenge up. And so he just uh, never was able to kind of finish off and beat the players above him. So he would say one thing, but his abilities were something very different. And uh, we're going to see that same thing right now, that God is basically going to call the bluff and say, all right, you think, Baal, you think you're it, you followers of Baal, Ahab, you think that's it, it's go time. Challenge match is on. And that's where we are at Mount Carmel. And I want us to know this as we're coming in to this, this time. The setting is this. Ahab's been king for a little while. And they're suffering. As a country, they're suffering because they are in the middle of a very long drought. And nothing they've been able to do has been able to bring rain because God says it's not going to happen unless Elijah prays for it. And so Elijah had already showed up and said, hey, it's not going to rain unless I say it. And then Elijah seemed to just disappear. And so Ahab has been looking all over the place, all the other surrounding countries saying, where, oh, where, oh, where is Elijah? Where, oh, where, oh, where is Elijah? But he can't find him. And then some one random day, boom, Elijah is just there and saying, Ahab, it's go time right now. Let's do this thing. And so that's the situation. They're already suffered. Uh, there are consequences of, of really just walking away from God. And, and scripture makes that clear. In 1 Kings 18, verse 17, when Ahab sees Elijah, the first thing that he says to him, he says not like, oh, it's so good to see you. Would you please make it rain? No, he says, is this you, you troubler of Israel? What a great attitude. Well, Elijah, he responds and says, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house has because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord you have followed the Baals. You have identified with the wrong God. And so uh, Elijah said, it's go time. Challenge match on. In verse 20, he says, Now then, send and gather to me all of Israel at Mount Carmel, and together send the 450 prophets of Baal. It is go time. That's not in the text, but it is. It's go time. And so if you're wondering, where is Mount Carmel? It's up there in the northern portion of Israel's territory. Very interesting. To me, at least, Ahab's wife, she came from a little bit further north from there, and that territory was 100% Baal is the dominant god. And so she is taking and bringing the dominant god down into, the dominant deity down into Israel. And so here they are, Mount Carmel, uh, getting ready for a showdown. Now, let me also help us, and I know we're kind of getting like uh, bogged down a little bit, but I think this is important just for us to understand why he's picking on Baal. Now, in Baal, in Hebrew, in Baal, in Hebrew, the word Baal, it means, uh, when, not when you're talking about the, the deity, but if you're just using it as a regular noun, it means master, husband, Lord. And so people would begin to confuse their language when they would be talking about God, when they talk about Yahweh, they would call him their master, their Baal. And so for a long period of time, there had been this subtle confusion coming through with the words where people thought, isn't Baal really Yahweh? And so God is coming to set this record straight. Now, uh, as far as when they're talking about Baal, the deity, you need to understand this. It's going to be very helpful for us to have a better understanding he was viewed as the supreme deity in the Can uh, Canaanite pantheon. And so out of all of the gods, the top dog god was Baal. He's it. He's the strongest. He was, he was the weather god. He was associated with thunderstorms. His, his weapon of choice when he would fight people, his weapon of choice was lightning. Okay, and some even thought he's the inventor. He created lightning because he's so strong. He's also affiliated with fertility. And Mount Carmel, for example, uh, not for example, it was his territory. It was up there that you could actually come and encounter him. And so this is who he's fighting. This is what his reputation is. This is where they are fighting. And so um, it's interesting. They've gathered together. And Elijah comes out and he says this. He says, all right, Elijah came near to all the people and he said, how long will you hesitate between two options? 
If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. They're like, we don't know. We don't know who to identify with. I highlighted the word answer because that's a key word throughout this section. They're looking for an answer. Who is God? Now, as we, can, as we just reviewed here, just a little chart-wise, you've got the two contestants. You've got Baal and you've got Yahweh. The location, it's Baal's home territory. It's his mountain, right? So check mark to Baal, no good for Yahweh. As far as the prophets, he's got 450 of them. Yahweh got one. As far as the actual test, the idea is we're going we're gonna to build these altars, and what's going to happen is we're going to put our offering on there, and whoever answers by lightning, that's going to be the God. So the actual test, that again, Baal, he's the one who's in charge of the weather. Baal, he's the one who invented lightning. All of those check marks, when you line them up, you're thinking, this is a no-brainer. Elijah, you're not being very smart. You're coming on their home court against all odds, Picking like the weapon of choice of Baal. How, how foolish of you. So what they do is they, they bring two, uh, two oxes up there and, and Elijah says, you choose. He lets them choose. You go first. You choose between these two which one is going to be the best. You use them. You get your altar. We're going to build it. You're going to go ahead and you're going to put your sacrifice on there. Nobody can light any fire underneath of that. And we're going to call on our God and whoever answers by fire that is the one who is the true God. It's very interesting, is it not, that they've had three years of drought. And Baal is the weather God. He hasn't been able to do anything for the last three plus years. Why would we think he's going to be able to do anything now? Don't know. But here's how the story goes, right? And so uh, they, 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 uh, the prophets of Baal are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they make their sacrifice. They put it on the altar. And there they are from morning into noon. They're just... They're calling out, you know, come on, Baal, come on, Baal, you can do it, Baal, come on, Baal, answer now, show this guy, come on, Baal, come on. And at noon, it's really funny, Elijah, he just begins to mock. Uh, he says, maybe he's falling asleep. Maybe he's gone on a trip, you got to just yell louder. Or maybe, maybe he just had to relieve himself. And so he's mocking them, and they continue to call on Baal all the way through the evening sacrifice time. And so for the, from early morning Almost the end of the day, they had been sitting there with this ton of time calling out to Baal, who answers them nothing. They get so intense, they start cutting themselves. Like, it's like, come on, Baal, I'll cut myself. Here's some blood. Here's some blood of mine. Answer me, answer me. They just rev it up and no answer. Truly incredible. They've had all this time. Then Elijah said to all the people, he says, Come near to me. So all the people did. Came near. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. And then he does something crazy. He, he repairs the altar, and then he says, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And so they get these four pitchers of water, dump it on. And he said, Do it a second time. And they do it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Truly, truly incredible. You've got the altar. It's now soaked with water. There's a trench around that's filled with this. Twelve pitcherfuls of water have been poured on this. Twelve tribes of Israel have made uh, a, an obstacle, a barrier to try to, to push Yahweh away. And yet, uh, we're going to see something incredible unfold here. But again, if you're just looking clearly at the scorecard, the location, the prophets, the, the actual test, the amount of time and duration, it seems like that's time of possession. That goes to Baal and not to Yahweh. And as far as an obstacle, Baal had no obstacle. And yet Yahweh says, soak it. And they soak it. This looks like a hopeless situation. As a matter of fact, it looks a lot like, again, the Aggies with 40 seconds left in the game. It looks like there's just no way. And sadly, like the Aggies, actually in this case is really good, but sadly for my Panthers when they lost. Everything is, is soaked, and Elijah, he prays. He says, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all of these things at your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me. There are the key words again, that these people may know 
that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart, hearts back again. Can you imagine just being there? I mean, oh, God, please, answer. I mean, just, you're there, answer. Boom, and here it is. And just fire falls down, consumes the sacrifice, the altar, and all of the water, everything. Boom, gone. I mean, can you see it? Can you imagine being there and seeing all day, the other side has been asking for lightning from the lightning God, and he does nothing. And then Elijah just comes together, one, against 450, and just prays. And as he prays, boom, lightning hits. God responds, and people fall down and say, he is God. It's truly an incredible, incredible moment. It's a no-brainer. Who are you going to identify with? And man, I wish, I wish we could say that that Ahab was like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. You know, when you, as you read the text, you see Ahab's just really kind of disinterested. He's just kind of hungry, and so Elijah just tells him, go get something to eat because it's getting ready to rain. I'm going to pray for rain, and, and rain's going to fall. And so this bad king Ahab, you just see him again really not that interested, even though this miraculous thing has just unfolded before his eyes. And um, it's sad, truly sad, but you see why. <laughs> why he's a bad king. But so what? Great story, Todd. You know, thanks, Bible. That was great. But what does it have to do with my life? And I'm so glad that you asked. Because here's the deal. I want us to just think about a few different things. You need to know this. I need to know this. Idols don't work no matter how hard you try. Like, think about that. Idols, they don't work no matter how hard you try. And if you think about that, when you look at the, the prophets of Baal, they just continue. They start out calling. Baal, come on. Come on, Baal. Come on. And then they started jumping around. Baal, come on. Come on, Baal. You can do it. Come on, Baal. You can do it. Yeah. And then they start yelling, Baal, do it. Come on. And that doesn't do it. They just continue to up it, cutting themselves. No amount of work that they did, the idol wasn't going to work. No matter how hard they worked at. And we need to understand this as well because we have idols. You know, the, the one thing here that I was thinking about, this virus that has us all sheltered in place and social distancing, is it, it's really a great opportunity for our idols to come to the surface. Whether those things have been taken away, if our job, if our job was the number one thing that we found our identity in and now all of a sudden we have to work remotely or... or uh, Maybe our other thing is that we really love our fitness and our reputation at the gym because we're like the buffest guy around. Like we find our value, our worth, and identity in fitness, and now all of a sudden we can't go to the gym and get that at a boy or at a girl. We start getting irritable because that's been taken away. See, during this time, I really do believe that we're all turning to something for comfort. We're turning to something to uh, find hope, something to establish our value and our worth in. And it's just going to be, it just continues to be exposed over and over and over again. And if you're wondering, like, how do I identify an idol? I mean, like, if you have an idol, idol of relationships, for example, basically the thing would be once I have a relationship, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a fiance, or a husband or a wife, once I have that, then life will be. It's an idol, and it's not going to work, no matter how hard you try it. If it's fitness, if it's trying to reach a certain weight or trying to reach a certain weight of bench pressing, you might be thinking, if I just get this, then I'll get this. Then I'll have value. Maybe it's just your, your overall looks and then clothing. If I just get this new shirt, then people will like me more. Then I'll have a relationship. Then people will look and say, wow, he's really it. Maybe it's your hair. Not for me, but maybe it is. If I just, once I get that new look, then life will make sense. Maybe it's your job. Once I get the position of whatever, then life will make sense. Then I'll have value. Maybe it's gaming. Maybe you're sitting there just going, man, if I just earn one more skin, if I just beat this one more level, if I just, once I do that, then I have bragging rights. Then I have value. Then I'm important. Maybe it's a car. Once I'm driving a BMW, once I'm driving you know, a car maybe. I don't know what it is, but once I'm driving whatever, then life will get better. Maybe it's a house. Once I own not just a house, but like the dream house, my forever home, then life will be great. 
Maybe it's the other end. Those things aren't bad in themselves, but maybe it's the other end. You're sitting there just going, man, things are so intense, I can't make it unless I have alcohol to turn to. I can't live without it. It's what comforts me. Man, it's been an intense day. All I need to do is he needs to have a release, and so I've got to seek out pornography. You know, during these times of isolation, our idols are going to well up. Now, that's just a, a, a matter of fact. It's just going to happen. But we need to remember that the idols, they don't work no matter how hard you try. See, our, our effort won't lead to success if the thing we are pursuing doesn't work. I mean, say it again. Our effort won't lead to success if the thing we are pursuing doesn't work. Baal didn't work. For three years, he couldn't bring rain. And no matter how much effort they put in, he wasn't going to show up. Our idols, have we realized it yet? That money, power, people, stuff, all of that, that it's not going to complete us. Have we realized that? No matter how much of it we have, have we really let that sink in? It's kind of like, you know, well, I can endure anything, you know, if I just binge watch whatever, and then I get to the end of the 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 series, and I'm like, I just don't, I don't feel fully satisfied and fully complete. I must have watched the wrong show. Somebody tell me the next best show. And then I watch a whole other series, and I get done with that series. I'm like, man, that was great, but I still feel empty. Well, I, it was just the wrong show. Like, give me another show. And so I spend all this time and energy binge-watching things that I think are going to give me life, but they don't. It's just passing time. I'm just existing as opposed to truly living the life that God has for me. Idols don't work no matter how hard you try. And so I want to encourage us to take some, some downtime here and just really reflect, like, what am I pursuing to give me worth? What is it? What if, if I'm really just in the stillness and the privacy of my, my own place, if I just begin to reflect and I begin to talk to God, Lord, what is it that I'm really pursuing trying to give me value and worth? I don't like that because, again, we've talked about a lot of times, people pleasing is right up there. If I just get one more attaboy, one more attaboy, you know, and that's just a dangerous cycle because... No amount of attaboys is ever going to do it. I've got to come in and understand that I'm a new creation in Christ. And that what he says about me, that's what matters the most. The second thing I want us to take away from this here is simply this, that, that God repairs and God declares. Now, what, what I'm saying here is, is this. Like, this is, blew my mind. Okay, so you're up there on Mount Carmel with him. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near. All the people came near, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Now, this is incredible, because the top of this mountain, it used to be a place that they worshipped Yahweh. It, was, it used to be a place where they worshipped God, and yet disaster came in, and that place drifted in its purpose. And yet Elijah comes and repairs it. And as he repairs, it becomes the very place that had been defeat becomes the place of repairing and this great declaring that God is great, that his grace is sufficient, that he is the one we need to identify with. And when you think about that word repair, it simply means this. In Hebrew, it comes back, it means to be healed, to make whole. So when Elijah was up on the mountain saying, where am I going to build this altar so that God can declare his incredible glory? He looked around and he saw what used to be set apart for God, and it is now broken, devastating. And he makes repairs, brings, makes it whole. And what was shattered seemed like it was a waste, seemed like it was just too big of obstacles to overcome. God stepped in and declared, it is sufficient. This is great. My power can work even here. Point being this, I don't know how many of us walk around feeling a whole lot of guilt, and shame over past defeats that we've had. We've, we've had these struggles that have been with us for maybe our whole lives or whatever area that is, and we just feel like, I've, certainly I've disqualified myself. God is the one who comes through, and he is your sufficiency, and he can work through those broken vessels as he repairs. And that's the gospel, isn't it? I mean, we're all born broken. We're, we're born separate. We don't function as designed we know it, so we try to stuff all these idols in, and they don't work. And yet Jesus comes down, and he pays the price for our sins on the cross to bring us back into a relationship with God, which is truly incredible. And then he, he's die, he dies, and then he's buried, and he's raised again on the third day according to scriptures. 
He's raised and new life has come in. He has repaired us. And now we are this altar, this place that God can come and is willing to work in and through to declare his incredible glory to the world around us. This is beautiful. On top of Mount Carmel, we can't miss that, that Elijah repaired. He made it whole. He healed it. And when God brings that healing to our lives, then all of a sudden we are ready to declare. And so I want to challenge us uh, with a few things. First question is this. I mean, really, has God repaired you? I mean, has he? He's put it together and he's offered it. And you might be hanging around the fringes, you know, kind of like me saying the Aggies are great. I live near A&M, but I'm not actually an Aggie. But I try to get all the benefits of it. And so I'm near, but I'm not actually one. Have you been raised that way? And so you're sitting there, but you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, for healing to come in. That he did it for you. And you said just... Has God repaired you? If he has, that's awesome. Let's celebrate. If he hasn't, I just encourage you, I challenge you, even right now, just to stop and go like, I know there's a big, big chasm between me and you, God. I know that. And you say your son has come and paid the price for me, that nothing I can do will ever be enough for you, Lord. You've told me that my best deeds are but filthy rags, and yet your son, he came and he paid the price for my sins. And so, Lord, I don't fully understand how that works, but I believe it, I trust it. And so thank you, Lord, for that incredible gift. At that time, boom, God has repaired you. That's incredible. It's beautiful. So has God repaired you? And if he has, does that leave you in awe? Like, do you sit there and just walk around dumbfounded? Side note, just quick story, then I'll wrap things up again. I'm going on too long, but that's just a Todd thing. Uh, two days ago, I was walking and listening to Dwell uh, in my headphones, and there was this guy who was running in front of me, and he, he finished running, and I could still see him, and I don't think that he knew that I could see him because he's doing this. He's like, yes, 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 yes. I mean, literally, that's what he's doing. And then he saw me seeing him, and of course, I'm so weird, this is what I'm thinking in my brain, like, he must have the Dwell app, and he's listened to Second Chronicles, you know, 20. Like, that's what I'm thinking in my mind. I know, it's probably not what's happening, he's probably listening to Rocky, you know, and reliving things. But he sees me, as he's doing this, and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, stretch out, stretch out. But does the work of God in your life lead you to these places where like, yes, this is incredible. I, I was thinking about this in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 and 4. You know, it talks about that, that uh, of first importance, Paul delivers to the, the, to the folks the same message that he received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried on the third day. He was raised again according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to all of these people. Like the magnitude of that, if you, if you really think about this, like you know him. If you've been repaired, you know that guy. The guy who overcame death, the guy who has liberated millions, you know that guy. That's exciting. And so my hope and prayer is that we would be just moved to excitement by the work of God, that what he has done in our lives, and because we know him, that we would not have a ho-hum response like Ahab did to the work of God, that we would instead sit there and be like moved by like, God, you're incredible, and it's, 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 it's amazing to me that you have saved a wretch like me, and that then would cause us to begin to engage with others and tell them about the one who has repaired us, who has made us whole. He's repaired us so that we can turn around and declare his glory. And it doesn't mean that we have to go right out and tell everybody that you're wrong and we're going to be argumentative. It means that all of a sudden as God's spirit is at work in us, and as we begin to see and reflect on the things that he has done for us, he changes us. And people begin to take notice. People who have known us for a long time, they're like, you used to not be patient, but now you're patient. You used to not be joyful, but now you're joyful. You know, you used to not have a whole lot of peace, and yet now there's a lot of peace. What is that? As we follow Jesus, he is transforming us. And as he transforms us, he's going to create a platform for us to declare his great glory. But he's also going to give us opportunities, maybe, of, of engaging with neighbors and asking them how they're doing, man. Are, are, are you freaking out during this time with this virus? Like, how are you feeling? How are you responding to this? Where, man, do you, like, I don't know if you're spiritually like that, but, like, where would God be in the middle of us? Have you thought about that? And begin some of these dialogues with their neighbors. I want us to spend some time, again, reflecting the fact that has God repaired you? If so, man, does it leave you in awe? And if not, why not? Why not? 
And if the reason why it doesn't leave you in awe is because, well, I don't have the job I want, I don't have the girl I want, I don't have the guy I want, I don't have the clothes I want, I don't have the physique that I want, I don't have blah, 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 blah. Whatever that thing is, it doesn't leave me in awe because I don't have blah, blah, whatever that blah, blah is, it's probably one of your idols, one of the things that uh, you're trying to find life, value, identity, and worth from. And all throughout Scripture, the result when an idol is before God is to destroy it. So um, as we've looked today, uh, we looked at background, we looked at Mount Carmel, and we looked a little bit at so what. And so my challenge for you coming into this next week, read 1 Kings chapter 18, 20 through 46. Read it for yourself, and then spend some time reflecting. What am I pursuing to give me worth? And really think about what is that, and does it really work? I mean, does it really work? Not is the advertisements say, yes, this will give you um, everything you want. Kind of like those old Axe ads. I mean, they, maybe they're still out there, but they used to have this Axe spray chocolate. This is years ago, and so you would like, oh, you would spray this. This guy would spray it, and all of a sudden he would turn it into chocolate, and these women would like, oh, they come in, and they just had to just be near because apparently all women love chocolate, and so... As you sit there, maybe that's what the media is telling you. That's what marketing is telling you. But the reality is Axe chocolate spray is not going to change your life that way. It's not going to all of a sudden have you walk into a room and a multitude of people want to be near you. Do we know that? Are the things that we're pursuing, do they really, really work? And I just want to challenge you, too, as you reflect. Are you unimpressed with God's work in your life? When you really stop and think about, God, what have you done in my life? Does it leave you in awe or are you just kind of, eh? And wrestle with that. If it's, eh, wrestle with it. But why is, eh, your response? And then I encourage you, like always, ask someone about, man, have you thought much about like what you're pursuing to give you worth? Does it really work? Man, are, are you impressed with what God has done in your life or are you unimpressed with it? Lean into those conversations, but go first. Be willing to go first. And show that you're, you're, you're willing to go ahead and be real. We, we need to be a, a, a people who are willing to be real with one another. So thank you for spending the time with me this evening. I'm so thankful for that opportunity just to share with you all. Uh, so excited for your table groups that you're going to dive into next. And so let me close this in prayer, and then you guys will dive into uh, your table groups. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you that... That uh, as we looked at Ahab, Lord, uh, there's a lot of things a lot we could have talked about, Lord, and that you just continue to bring Mount Carmel to the top, Lord. And so I just pray that uh, even through maybe my inability or um, if I was confusing with any language or boring with any history, Lord, I pray that you would have worked through all of that um, to really work in the hearts of the men and women here at Junction. Father, I want to pray and ask that these table times that we gather together, Lord, that we would um, really still connect with each other, that we would look at the screen and see human beings and see each other as you see the other person. We would look to lavish encouragement, that we look to lavish also just truth, that we'd be willing to speak truth and love with one another. Father, I pray that you would draw us all near to you, and that as you do, that you would continue to build an incredible community here uh, in, a minute, in and among the people of Junction. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for taking the time, and we'll see you next week, if not sooner. Bye.